Twitter from Leeds to uh, tell us all about heart failure and devices in 2017. Nice. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, thank you all for coming back. It's a delight that the audience haven't thinned out too much, although I do see some spare chairs where there were one on a moment ago. Um, it's great to see a range of people here today, and it's an honour to, um, to be given the opportunity to review the year in 2017. I have deliberately not made this completely comprehensive. I've picked things of interest to me that might be of interest to you and might challenge you a little bit and or challenge me if you ask me the right questions. I'm a cardiologist with an interest in heart failure and devices um, working in Leeds. Heart failure is an incredibly common condition. We heard earlier about diagnosing amyloidosis and I have to say that heart failure is still more common than amyloidosis as far as I know. Um, we do have very good therapies that are proven to work. We still have some problems with penetrance and we still have problems with full application of the proven therapies. One of the and most amazing therapies to come along in my time as a heart failure doctor was, of course, CRT, and uh, proven to reduce hospitalization and mortality in a randomized placebo-controlled trial called CARE-HF, published 12 years ago. It's a very straightforward procedure with a low complication rate and a good improvement in outcomes. However, it is still perceived as having an upfront cost that is high-ish, and of course there are some upfront complications. So I just wanted to think of us to think a little bit about if we want to improve the uptake of CRT in those people who are eligible, we could look at improving cost-effectiveness. In order to do that, you can do several things. You can improve the effectiveness of the treatment um, by optimizing for example, or you could refuse treatment to subgroups that have been shown perhaps to benefit less, uh, that are currently indicated, or you could put it in and not see them again, that's a way of reducing costs, or you could make the device cheaper. So all of these things would improve the cost effectiveness, um, but of course the problem is, is how do you measure effectiveness? Chronic disease is chronic. And patients generally with heart failure continue to get worse over the course of time until they're in their grave. This is a traditional responder, and I think we'd all say that this is what we want to happen to us or our granny if they have a CRT pacemaker put in. It is, of course, what's usual for the treatment of pneumonia with amoxicillin. However, this is also a responder to CRT and or heart failure therapies and or MS or COPD. Interestingly, this is also a responder. But in every observational study that has been done, including all that have been done in 2017, this person at the end there is a non-responder. So we need to be very, very careful when we look at data. These, this is uh, just a simplification of a Packer score, which is a very sensible way to establish whether a patient has responded. But in an observational study, it is, of course, also flawed because you don't know what would have happened to the patient had they not had the treatment. There, is, there are always graphs like this published trying to identify the reasons why patients don't respond to a treatment. And in CRT, some of the reasons why people might not respond to CRT are listed down there. For those of us that do devices, we know that sometimes the timing isn't quite right or they might have other clinical features. But of course, for device companies and for device doctors, we always try and improve the way the device is delivering the treatment. Bear in mind that although this graph is now almost 10 years old and is shown in almost every CRT talk, it was of 75 people in an observational study and included people who had responded and then got worse and labelled them as non-responders. So there are, all, there are flaws in everything that we look at. Let's have a look at some of the data from 2017. I'm not going to go through the first one particularly. I'm, also, I'm not going to mention particularly the uh, differences in outcomes for IHD versus dilated patients. But I just want you to look at the six studies below, all of which to me seem obvious. If you start off worse, you're less likely to get better. Now, it doesn't mean to say you have failed to respond. 
And all of these studies, published in 2017, show us that journal editors and our colleagues have not yet got it. That you cannot tell whether somebody has responded once you've put the device in. I'll talk a little bit about one study that looked at AV and VV timing. Some of you will have heard of it. This was a study done by a relatively small device company called uh, Levanova, and um, unlike all other response studies where AV, atrioventricular, and ventricular, ventricular timings were optimized, this was a randomized control trial where the standard of care was repeated echocardiography to optimize the timing. Here, the, uh, but all patients uh, uh, received a, a lovely hemodynamic monitor embedded in the atrial lead, which measures um, a marker of um, aortic outflow, um, and the AV and VV timings can be automatically optimized during both rest and exercise in order to improve aortic outflow. And the reason I picked this is because it was a randomized controlled study. They did use this modified Packer score to demonstrate, first of all, non-inferiority to echo, which we probably think is marginally better than doing nothing, perhaps. Um, and they looked at some secondary outcomes in terms of hospitalization and mortality. The primary efficacy endpoint showed that it is no worse and perhaps somewhat better than echocardiography, and I don't think most of us do echocardiography on a repeated basis. But it also showed that in patients at particularly high risk, there was a reduction in hospitalization. Those with particularly broad left bundle branch block, those with a history of atrial fibrillation, and those with renal dysfunction. So those patients in whom you might predict might do slightly worse from CRT seem to do better if you optimize them on a repeated basis using this monitoring device in the atrium based on their hemodynamics. So we've got one way that we can perhaps improve the cost effectiveness of a device that you've paid for up front. I'm not a huge fan of refusing treatment to subgroups currently indicated. It's a bit challenging. Uh, I'll give you an example. For example, defibrillators are not particularly well proven in the over 75s and yet NICE is reluctant to recommend that we don't implant ICDs in older people. Remote monitoring, of course, is a way that we could keep an eye on our patients without seeing them. Seems sensible, maybe even associated with better outcomes. I can reassure you it is not. All of the data so far on remote monitoring suggests that there is a trend to increased activity, but with no benefit on outcomes. The only study published this year looking at remote monitoring of any significance is the More Care study showing that it didn't make any difference in terms of clinical outcomes, but it was perhaps a bit cheaper because it saved the patients coming to clinic. And that is a, a potentially important endpoint close to my own heart. You could alternatively make the treatment cheaper. And this is going to challenge. There are, I'm going to just briefly review the history of ICDs in heart failure. I'm going to tell you that heart failure is changing. There is an elephant in the room, ladies and gentlemen, and people keep avoiding it. So here's a reality check. Go back to 2005, scud heft, ICDs in patients with left ventricular systolic dysfunction, no benefit in those with class 3 heart failure. If you have a shock, there's a good chance you'll be dead within 24 hours. So the shock didn't really help, except to help to let you say goodbye to your family. It takes 24 months for the curves to divide, and there are complications associated with the implant. Made it too. 13 years ago, ladies and gentlemen, $235,000 per life year gained, mean survival after the first shock of 96 days. The shock is not happening for some miraculous reason because Donald Trump has been elected. The shock is happening because your heart failure is getting worse. Companion. If you need a study of 1,200 people to show a difference between a device that costs you 15,000 and one that costs you 4,000, perhaps there's not that much difference. Everybody always says Companion was under power to show a difference. But isn't that the point? Even in secondary prevention, be very careful. So, last year, in 2016, 
the team in Denmark chose to do a very brave and sensible study based on that background. They took all their dilated patients and they randomized them to ICD or not, and there was no significant difference. Now, if you're young, and possibly if you have some mid-wall fibrosis, that may be an indication for an ICD, even if you have dilated cardiomyopathy. However, why is this now happening? Well, I'll tell you why. Because sudden cardiac death is going away, ladies and gentlemen. With the advent of aggressive medical therapy, sudden cardiac death is becoming a thing of the past. My patients and your patients are actually far more likely to die of non-cardiovascular causes, lung cancer, pneumonia, COPD, than they are of sudden cardiac death, and even, to a certain extent, progressive heart failure. This paper was published this year. Shen et al. from McMurray has pulled together large numbers of patients from large numbers of studies over the last 20 years, and you can see that sudden cardiac death over 24 months at 45 to 5%, you have to accept that's pretty difficult to improve upon. So, in the absence of a randomized controlled study, this is our data from Leeds, published this year. 795 people, not truly randomized, of course. Randomized uh, or allocated CRTP versus CRTD based upon the operator, which was me. CRT patients are older, they have a higher MIHA class, they have more AF, they have a broader QRS, they have worse renal function, they have less optimal therapy, more digoxin use, and the curves overlap. All right? So there's nothing weird about the patients in Leeds. Honestly, the benefit of CRTD is overstated. So, should we put D in all? Well, only in the US, really. And importantly, our patients also have to be given the choice up front. I tell all my patients that there will come a time where their defibrillator needs to be switched off. And we also need to consider the costs, ladies and gentlemen. These two young ladies save more lives per year than the three defibrillators that cost the same as them. And of course, it's not about the upfront cost of the defibrillator. It's the incremental cost-effectiveness ratio compared to CRTP that is what you need to work on. So you can't say, well, the device costs 15 grand, the other device costs 5 grand. It's the incremental cost versus the incremental benefit that is always misquoted. So let's think about some other new stuff. There are electrophysiologists who think that his bundle pacing is the new holy grail. Um, if you can't get the LV lead in or you have had CRT and you've failed to respond or you are pacemaker dependent, and as a result of these three things, you have heart failure, his bundle pacing is a promising alternative. There's a website. It's interesting, but I doubt very much whether we're going to be doing this for our complete heart block patients. I suspect that there is a fad here, that there are enthusiasts in the room, there are enthusiasts around the world, rather like there are enthusiasts for putting a CRT pacemaker into everybody with complete heart block. In an unselected population, that's unlikely to be of benefit. There is also this little publication here, um, the WISE CRT. There's a way to upgrade a DDD pacemaker or a DR defibrillator using a grain of rice in your left ventricle and a big transducer that sits under your armpit that can send signals through to it. Again, there are enthusiasts. It's not yet ready for uh, general clinical use. It's very interesting technology, but I think you need to, so we need to sort out some of these serious events. So, devices other, because I'm not just a dev a, a pace, an electronic cardiac implantable devices doctor. I'll talk briefly about MitraClip and then something else that puts a hole in the heart. Functional MR is very common in patients with heart failure and is associated with worse outcomes. But, it is associated also with worse heart failure. So, whether it's an independent predictor or merely a marker of an advanced heart failure syndrome is unknown. There are, of course, enthusiasts for tying the mitral leaflets together in some way or reducing the size of the annulus to reduce functional mitral regurgitation. And there are two studies ongoing, but, but a, an explosion in the potential treatments for this. I won't focus on any of these other potential treatments here. I'm going to focus on the two ones that are being investigated. 2018, if I'm invited back, 
I may be able to tell you the results of both of these studies. The first study is, is around mitraclip. Mitraclip is a good treatment for degenerative MR. We don't really know whether it's a good treatment for functional MR. It does cause a little bit of mitral stenosis in some patients and does leave an ASD in some patients. We're waiting for the results of the COAP study, which will hopefully be published towards the end of 2018. There are other ways of doing it. The Reduce FMR study is in the competitor device, which is an annulus cincher, dead easy to put in, takes about 35 minutes to do through an internal jugular. Slight problem is that occasionally you can occlude the circumflex artery. This end goes into the top end of the coronary sinus. This goes into the os after you've pulled everything a bit shorter. But if you can get it in and you don't cause circumflex that in, uh, impingement, it's a very, very safe procedure. And I always say to my trainees and my colleagues, look, if something doesn't work very well but it's cheap and safe, that's not bad. <laughs> so, other devices. If you, I'm not going to talk much about HEFPEF because I don't think anybody really knows what HEFPEF is. Again, I said I'd be controversial, right? <laughs> but if you have HEFPEF, in other words, you're breathless and you don't have left ventricular dysfunction and you don't seem to have end-stage COPD and you haven't got cancer or anemia, then putting a, a shunt into your atrium, atrial septum is associated with whoopie do a reduction in your wedge pressure during exercise. I was stunned that this came into Late Breakers 2017. It was all over the uh, online follow-up media. It doesn't describe whether the patients got any benefit. It just says the wage pressure was lower. How does that get into New England Journal of Medicine? I couldn't get an NIHA grant to do that sort of work. Because they'd say, so what? Are the patients better? Who cares about the wage pressure? Nobody comes to my clinic saying my wage pressure is lower. Thank you very much. <laughs> Outcomes in heart failure. This is one of the most interesting things that I read this year. In 2010, the Americans introduced a hospital re readmission reductions program. In other words, if you're readmitted 30 days after a discharge from heart failure, your hospital got fined. So what that actually led for was a reduction in 30-day readmission, but an increase in mortality. <laughs> okay? So these findings may, may require reconsideration of this program. Published in JAMA Cardiol. Not in JAMA. Very interesting. So there's always cynicism and there's always believers, but there's always, we always have to make sure that we check the data. Fake news is everywhere. <laughs> this is another interesting feature. Stem cells are everywhere. Everybody's investing in stem cells. You can get grants to do stem cells for anything. It's interesting. Stem cells, despite all the work and all the investment, still haven't really gone anywhere. All right. I'm starting to get a little bit worried about stem cells in heart failure. Atrial fibrillation. Again, an amazing study. This was Castle AF. 30% of our patients have atrial fibrillation. So you know, give them a decent dose of beta blocker, a little bit of digoxin, most of them will be just fine. But there are enthusiasts that we should get rid of atrial fibrillation in, in patients with heart failure. We should ablate them, giving them an ASD that in 10% of cases remains. So, does atrial fibrillation ablation work? Well, this was a small study. They screened 3,000 people and enrolled 397 in more than 30 centres. So, each centre was doing 10, 12 patients. Bit of a problem there, isn't it? Right, and then they had 37 months follow-up and they had an <laughs> incredible reduction in heart failure. Quite incredible almost halving of mortality. Either it's chance or it's incredible, but it certainly shouldn't change what we do at the, mo at the moment. Remember that a vast number of them were on amiodarone at the outset. And amiodarone is a bad thing, and if you achieve sinus rhythm, you may stop the amiodarone, right? I'll just leave that there. Acute heart failure is a leading cause of hospitalization, Lots of them die, and lots of them are readmitted. But the best thing for acute heart failure is a decent slug of IV frusamide and some oxygen. Serolaxin is neutral, and ularitide is also neutral, probably. 
if you consider hypotension to be not that much of a worry. So just carry on giving oxygen and fruzamide, see how you get on. So ladies and gentlemen, CRT optimization might be useful, but watch out for response trials, okay? Just watch out. ICV and CRT, choose wisely. Consider the residual risk. If somebody's on 10 milligrams of bisoprolol and you're going to stick a CRT device in, consider carefully what their underlying chances of having sudden cardiac death are. Remote monitoring is certainly not better. It might be cheaper. Mitral regurgitation, hopefully I'll stand here next year and I will talk a little bit about that. Discharge the patient when they're ready and readmit them when they're sick. <laughs> Stem cells... I think we need to start getting real. We should do decent, large studies. We shouldn't we should only in centers of excellence. We need to be very careful. There were two studies published in California in people who invest in a stem cell company and also are the directors of cardiology institutes that did the studies, and those are the only positive studies. Be very cautious when you do stem cells. Um, I think beta blocks and digoxin are fine for most in atrial fibrillation. All of these things are probably no better than oxygen loop diuretics alone. Let me ask you one final question. Should heart failure hospitalisation be an end point in trials? Or should it be all-cause hospitalisation and all-cause mortality? I can nail heart failure hospitalisation in an instant. I give them all diuretics at 120 milligrams BD. They won't come in with heart failure. They'll come in with renal failure. Okay? <laughs> So if your treatment causes a different problem in a heart failure patient that avoids a heart failure hospitalisation but doesn't avoid a different hospitalisation, that's not a good treatment. So I make a call that we should design studies about all-cause hospitalisation and all-cause heart failure. Many of our patients, of course, will not necessarily get hospitalised either. They will get treated with palliative care in the community, hopefully with IV diuretics for symptom relief. So all-cause hospitalisation, all-cause mortality. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you all very much.